I trust that spirit will talk to a person the way they need to hear it. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to The Lavender Lifestyle. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are talking about strengthening our intuition and spirituality. And we'll touch on some tools for self-guidance like palmistry, oracle decks, and astrology. So with us today is Heather Rowan Robbins. Heather Rowan Robbins is a ceremonialist and practical, intuitive, choice-oriented astrologer and palmist with over 30 years of experience. She's been on a lifelong interfaith spiritual search and has had an intuitive counseling practice since 1978. Hi, Heather. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? Oh, just wonderful. It's a beautiful spring day here in Montana. A deer just walked by my window, and I thought that gave us a blessing on our, our work here today. Oh, I love that. I, I love that you you live in such a different environment than I do. You're so connected to nature. Thanks for sharing that. So I want to know a little bit about your journey because you, you've you gone through this path of in, intuition, spirituality. You've studied astrology, palmistry, all of these topics. So how did you get into all of this? When I was a very young child, I had an autoimmune issue. I was allergic to my own antibodies. So at five, I remember watching them carry me into the bathroom to get me to steam me and get me breathing. Only I'm watching it from about 10 feet over a staircase. And so very early on, I realized that we are more than our bodies. And so what are we? And that search, that kind of understanding of process and projects. When I was a child, I listened to a lot of uh, and read uh, fairy tales and mythologies from around the world. And that really stoked up my uh, image set. We were living in Philadelphia at the time, and they have an amazing anthropology museum there. So I would go visit the mummies And look at the crystal ball that was from the Empress of China on a silver dragon was in the center of the room. And all these pieces made me hungry for knowing what else there was in the universe and where we were going. And when I was 14, I was at a school where the telephone operator, back when we had those sort of things, was the niece of a very famous astrologer. She was a better counselor than the school psychologist was by far. One day she said, oh, I'm a little worried about these two teachers. I go, why? He said, well, the aspects are kind of tough and it's hitting their charts because she had everybody's charts in the school. (laughs) And one of them was an elderly man who died on stage. And the other one was a young man who fell down and broke his leg. And I wanted to know Mm -hmm. how she did that Mm -hmm. and what else we could do with this information. And we was, normally she was very positive and hopeful and directive. And the other people that she spoke to about that, being a little careful, were a little careful and managed to avoid any process. So the idea that the information wasn't just you're screwed, but if you keep your eyes open and work with these aspects in a different way, that you have the choice to use this energy wisely and healthfully and not get stuck in the problem. And how old were you when you met her? 14. Oh, so you were very young. Very young. And then I carried my ephemeris everywhere I went when I ran away from home and explored the world and did all the kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Later on in a school, I was about 16 or 17. uh, The teacher of music and music history was Sushil Mukherjee from India, who was also a palmist. And I started pumping him from all the information that I can get. And he called me aside one day and said, could you be a little, keep an eye on this friend of yours? And I was a little worried about her too, but she was doing all right. And later on, uh, she was killed. And <gasps> when she was killed, I had an out-of-body experience oh at goodness. that very moment. Uh, and I remember that she did not play safe in the world. She was, you know, hitchhiking mm-hmm. in LA at the time, mm-hmm. not, not something to do. But the lines on her hands, and I have seen handprints. So I started collecting handprints. Wow. I collected handprints. I had a huge stack until a, until a uh, flood took them away. And I watched people's lines changed. And when they made a decision, 
that it changed their life course, the lines on their hands began to shift, wow. especially on the hand that they used to write with, where mm-hmm. your nerve energy comes out to the world. So I would see someone who had stopped drinking and started working out and asking good questions and going to therapy, suddenly their lifeline would double. Or oh, interesting. That someone who started, you know, doing drugs or kind of really fading out and not working on making the most of their life and a little network of fine lines might cover their hand. And so they their and their life energy was slowing down. And so it began to be a like, what do you need to do in your life to help you balance your hand out, balance your mm-hmm. life out, be whole and that was, you know, for fitting your disposition, not anybody else's. And wow. that became a, um, a wonderful search. Yeah. Since you talked about the t- topic of palmistry, that's actually what I wanted to start with because we haven't had someone talk about palmistry on our podcast yet. And I, I know most listeners might be listening to audio, but just know that we're, there's a video version of this in case you have anything you want to show. But the basics that I know is you, you have two hands. One of them, the lines represent what you're born with, and then the other one represents your life choices. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. That what are the is. What, what you have, the hand that you use, and I'm somewhat ambidextrous, mm. but the hand I use most to write with means that most of my mental and nerve energy comes out through my right hand. I see. And as so that that hand is going to show more of the changes by the changes mm. of my thoughts and my decision process. Now, the hands won't necessarily show problems or gifts that come in not because of anything you do, but because of the world. You know, may mm-hmm. it may not say that you're going to die in a war if you if you I nothing see. in your hand made you arrive there. For instance. So you're saying it's all, everything that's shown in our hand is from ourselves, our choices. Exactly. Our choices, ourselves. And you often see you in the two hands, the passive hand has all the gifts that you haven't used yet, as wow. well as all the problems you've already overcome. Okay. So, so that's more of the past. It's right? potential. It's oh, potential. It's okay. potential and, uh, you know, what you walked in with. Mm. And the the active hand is the hand that shows the changes that are happening because of the decision you made and because of mm. the events that have happened in your life. So, And I mean, mm-hmm. that's incredible to me because looking at my two hands, they are different. And mm-hmm. my question to you is like, how fast does your hand ha- do these new lines fast. form? You know? you know, I mean, again, and the lines shift and change. I don't know if you can see it. But mm. on my passive hand, my first finger is shorter than my third finger. But on my active hand, my third finger is longer than my f- is the long first finger is the longest. Wow! And it's not because they've cha- they're any different in size. It's because the bones shift in my hand <gasps> as I use it. And what does that mean specifically for you? Um, that means that I am becoming more connected to the world. Our pointer finger uh, talks about we go from our most involved mm-hmm. in the world to our most private in the little finger. So the I pointer see. finger is how we point, how we interact, how we engage. Okay. And over okay. my life, I am a fairly introverted person who's loving engaging the world more. Yes. And so that finger has become shifted in position to the other fingers in the hand. I see. So, so, so it was shorter in the in on it, one hand it, and it grew the way longer. They, exactly. It, it, it didn't grow longer. It shifted <laughs> longer. It shifted, it shifted. So position. So the hand, the fingers are pointing more towards that finger which makes it look longer. What about if you break a bone? Like I've, I've uh, fractured my thumb before. <laughs> Do those physical <laughs> occurrences mean careful. anything? When you see somebody's little finger sticking way out crooked. Yeah, you I've seen that. Your finger, and because mm-hmm. if they broke their finger, then it doesn't mean they're crooked. But oh, okay. if... If their little finger is all bent out of shape and they do not have arthritis and they do not have, do you ask a little bit about their health? Then it usually means that their most private life is a little mm, squirrely and you want to see other signs in the hand for, is that a matter of honesty or is that protection over their most private lives? Uh, Because it's our little finger is how we hear, how we speak, how we write, but it's often our, our most intimate relationships. And okay. so if your little finger, if you see someone whose little finger drifts way out when you're talking to them, it's how is, how do they relate usually in relationships 
because of the relationships to their parents when they're growing up. So if mm-hmm. um, if their little finger is way out, they may have some trust issues because one of their parents was not really trustable. I see. And so you'll often see that on the passive hand, but see it integrated on the active hand. Or mm-hmm. see it, you know, after a bad breakup, you'll see their little finger stick way out for a little while mm-hmm. and then come back. And that's very reasonable. It's just saying I'm I'm careful here. So, so to can you break down the basics for beginners? How to read? I'm sure all listeners are looking at their hands now. So, so maybe go one finger at a time. Can I, or what are can the I recommend basics? my book? Um, yes. and you can get it on Kindle. Uh, okay. Everyday Palmistry. It's palmistry mm-hmm. for not for palmists, but for anybody who uses because we use our hands all the time, and we yes. see people's hands, and it's an easy way to connect to people. I would have to say, be be very careful to look, you, before you get to know the lines. Think of the shapes of the hands. Yeah, the squarer the hand, the more grounded and solid a person is. So the very bottom of the hand is your basis. What? Where are you? You know, what's the fundaments? Is it square? Which means that you're basically logical and grounded. Is it quite rounded? Is the foundations of your life more sociable and connected? Then we look at the top of your hand. How are you beginning? How does your psyche, you think of the palm of your hand as you and your soul and your psyche. Your fingers are how you express that. So you might see a very square palm, someone who's fundamentally concrete and solid and real and here with very sociable rounded fingertips. So they express themselves very with, you know, grace and gentleness and sociability. Very long hand, long fingers are more philosophical. It's like imagining, thinking very carefully how they express themselves. If you have very wide fingers, very solid fingers, I mean, they express themselves concretely, practically, Mm -hmm. muscularly in the world. Yeah. So you'll see Um, that, you know, the ones we see with very long, can you hold your hands up for me? Yeah, I I I, tend to have, I guess, thinner, longer. mm -hmm, You've got the very kind of intuitive, you've got strong thumbs though. You've got I have a hitchhiker's thumb too. Yeah. What does and that mean? Well, that, you know, strong willpower, but quite flexible. You know, oh, I would say you have yeah. good common sense, which is the lower phalange and a lot of willpower, but you're fairly flexible about it. And you have these long and the pointy fingertips is the unusual sensitivity. You're aware of details. You know how to express little things. You take in Fundam, you know, you take in with delicacy and grace. You can get overwhelmed if it's too loud and busy and crazy, but you're very aware of the subtleties. So that long that you you want to put someone on detail work with pointy fingers, or ask them how they feel, or yeah. ask them to assess a situation. You rarely see um, surgeons with short, fat fingers. Ah, you know, so the yeah, surgeons like, usually have slender fingers, slender, I, I long, and well. often either pointed or fairly squared off because they're. So that means detail oriented. They're detail oriented, and they have a more practical side to it. I see, yeah. and then like thicker, stubbier fingers. You put means... your fingers together. Hold them up with your fingers together. You see, I can see right through the bottom half of your fingers. Money isn't yes. what drives you. Uh, ah. But you see that it's not that you don't like money, but money isn't uh, isn't what drives you. You could put you're looking at your this hand, this hole. Right? Yeah. Okay. I would could put coins in your hand and they would go through. But the knuckles <laughs> yeah. are. But you have a very strong middle phalange, like the the middle. The, the, there's the bottom phalange, which is the material world. The middle okay. phalange is the social professional world, and there's the kind of mental expressive is the top you Mm -hmm. have a good strong middle section to your fingers from what i can see and that means you have a good profession and here you are a wonderful Uh, podcaster doing good work uh, in the world when you hold your hands up you can also see that it's very sociable in its expression the top of your palm but the bottom of your palm is quite square Mm. so you have you know a lot going on in you even big palms and uh but they're kind of hollow in the center very sensitive um, but underneath it all, you have a, a pretty good sense of practicality and follow through. Wow. I love that. You you don't even need to look at it in detail. You can just see from the camera and say all that's those just things. From the, that's just from the shape of your palm. From the shape. I, I can't see. even see the lines because exactly. you know, the camera isn't quite good enough. But mm-hmm. often people send me um, photographs of their hands and I can enlarge them on the right. computer and see the details. So oh, that works. 
Uh, and I, I might just that. do that. I might just send you a photo of my hands <laughs> yeah, and request you to do that later. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. it's, it's quite fun, uh, but and I find it works really well. I'm also I also work with astrology, tarot, all mm-hmm. you know, all all the intuitive arts. Right. But with, I find that astrology talks about your time in space, how the, you're responding to the world patterns, the big universal patterns and what's going on in the world. Palmistry is how you are, your interior journey, your interior process. And so you get a lot by putting the two together. So you need so, to look at both of them. I, 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 I guess they tell you helpful. different things. Right. So when I can, <sighs> I work them, I put them together. When I, I normally I, I can do work with either one, but they work right. really well together. Right. So you talked about how we, so, so you essentially believe we have a choice to change our fate. Always. Nothing is set in stone, right? Both in astrology Correct. and in your palm. Exactly. I, I feel that. like we co-create the world mm-hmm. that it's, it's not entirely up to us. Yeah, but we're working with who we are, what we walked in with, what we agreed to when we walked in, the mm-hmm. events around us, and we choose which end of it we focus upon. Every sign in astrology, every bit of it has every aspect, every house has a gift, a practical side, and a challenge. And usually, the cure for the challenge is found in the gift. And I see that in palmistry, it's more how is it balanced? If you have a mm-hmm line that dives off the side of your life, uh, very strong, but your heart line and your emotional and your lifeline are weak, then you say what you need is, you know, you think plenty. Uh, you came into this life with a very active mind. You need to be in your body, that lifeline. You need to mm. kind of feel your way on the earth and ground yourself in action. And you need to give your heart room to grow and mature and, and, de- and strengthen to balance, to create the balance in your hands so that all the lines work well together. Yeah. I mean, what are the main lines on the hand and what do they reveal they, or teach and us? They so you talked about lifeline. Mm-hmm. And I have, uh, sometimes you have, I have two lifelines. Mm-hmm. I have one lifeline, which is my sort of material inner world. And the outer lifeline is the one where I've engaged in the world more. And when I was younger, my f- first lifeline was kind of short and the other one hadn't quite reached up. And as I re- got more involved in the world and more engaged, both lifelines grew until wow. they were in parallel. I um, see. But the lifeline you read from between your thumb and first finger, um, and that starts there, that's your childhood. That's mm-hmm. usually got little islands on it and kind of looks a little crazy because you're not very aware of what's going on when you're yeah. a baby. But that reaches down towards the bottom of your wrist, towards your wrist. Then from the same starting point, your headline starts with your lifeline, could be connected or could be separate. Um, and it arches across towards what we call the percussion side, towards the underneath your little finger. Mm-hmm. Then your heart line starts under your little finger and reaches towards your first finger. Now it might mm-hmm. come up, uh, it might not touch the far corners, if you're kind of a little wary of the world, it might reach all the way under over here by the underneath your first finger. In that case, you tend to you get more emotional connection by your relationship to the public, and you're not as comfortable with personal relationships. It can go right up towards the middle of the first finger, and that's usually a fairly balanced relationship. And or it could come up between these the the first two fingers. Mm-hmm. And that's being more guarded, more a little more possessive, more private. Um, and that lifeline, it could not quite touch the far edges. And usually if it reaches out but doesn't quite touch the edge of your hand, which is fairly common, you can be open with your public persona, but you have to really trust that people actually want to get to know you to let them in. Mm -hmm. So they need to make that effort to step a little bit closer to you if they want to develop it, uh, develop a real friendship. 
I see. I'm also curious as you're, you have so much knowledge in this and I'm sure listeners are curious for more, definitely get her book, Everyday Palmistry. I'm curious how you learned all of this. You, you mentioned that teacher, but, mm-hmm. and if you can explain where this wisdom comes from, I know it's been passed on for so A many years. A lot of but, experiences. Yeah. Um, I first started off I said, I got the basics, the idea of looking into the window of a soul from my Sushil Mukherjee, my teacher in high school. And then when the word got out that I liked palmistry, everybody gave me palmistry books, mm-hmm. which was great. Nice. So yeah. I saw some wonderful ones by Fred Gettings, uh, the really interesting review of all the history of palmistry. Then there was a big, thick book That was one of the first books done on palmistry in the 1800s. And he hadn't really abstracted the concepts of, you know, that each shape means something, each piece. He kind of broke it down and gave case history after case history. But he had photographs of hands of, you know, dead people and stories. And he was packed with information. Wow. Then I started taking handprints and Mm -hmm. watching people watching them over time and watching children grow up and taking all that information in allowed me to observe how it it worked not what the theory of it was I could read up on the book but it, there's a big difference between reading the book and then watching people's lives actually change wow. so I think that it's been uh, you get a good framework and then start looking at hands that's why I love it, that I, I love that they into too many. Go ahead. Go ahead. To me, it, I mean, it might not exactly be science, but the process is very scientific. You, you, you're observing and you're experimenting. You're, you're seeing if these theories are, are real and are coming true. And I, I don't think people give, like when people hear palmistry, do they just think, oh, that's so woo woo. Like there's nothing behind it, but, but you can actually like, I don't know. There, there's so much depth to it. And there's so many observations and, and I guess studies people like you have done. Yeah. And I think there has been a lot of work done on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, it's more about disposition than what's actually going to happen. You mm-hmm. can look at it and you can break it down, but because the lines change, I think it's it's more about how do you become more whole Mm-hmm. more you, more of the best you you can be rather than, uh, you know, what exactly is going to happen when you're 35 and a half. Yeah. You know, that's where I would go to the details of astrology to help you map the specifics. But mm-hmm. palmistry can really help you know how to deal with somebody. Uh, you look at their hands and you know, you know, how to work with them, how to pitch them, how to kind of hear what they have to say. And in a way that helps, I think, you deal with the world, makes mm-hmm. your life easier. That's my Yeah, hope. it's true. If you understand the different shapes of hands, you can look at someone's hands and understand, oh, this person's very logical. I don't, I can't appeal to them with emotion or, or yeah, like, exactly. I, I think that is very helpful. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. And in the book, I give examples. I, you know, uh, I've got Nelson Mandela's hands and wow. Lady Gaga's hands. You can see a Fun. lot of famous people wave at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so you're like, oh, yes, let me see their hand. <laughs> you're like, let me they do that. that. <laughs> I love that. That's so yeah. much fun. Okay. So I do want to move on to talk about your Oracle deck because you just came out with this one. I'll, I'll show it on screen. Star Codes Astral Oracle deck. So I, I know some readers or some, sorry, some listeners, they've heard of tarot. They've probably heard of Oracle decks, but can you explain what's the difference? What are the but basics? The, the tarot is, I would say tarot is a form of Oracle deck. It's a very mm-hmm. specific pattern of, uh, of cards. It has a rich history. Often it's not quite as, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories made up about where tarot came from mm-hmm. that aren't true, but what it did come from is still fascinating. But any of these are symbol systems for your psyche to talk to you. They themselves don't have the power. But if you use, if you develop a way of communicating with your intuition, you might hear mediums talk about, you know, I the symbols that they, they see. I see you to the left. That means it's somebody on your wavelength. And I see white flowers, which means to me. And they did, they have developed a way for themselves to talk to their intuition through a set of symbols that comes to them. 
I often, if I'm trying to imagine, and, and my next deck may have this, when I am trying to, when somebody says, well, do you want to do this? Here's a great project. What do you think? I imagine if this was a road, what would it look like? You know, when I thought about doing this interview, I said, if that was a road, what would it look like? And it was a mm. beautiful, sunlit, wow. you know, uh, road in the countryside with flowers. So I said, mm-hmm. great, we'll do that. that. It, I have seen situations where I've said, oh, it's a cul-de-sac on fire. Probably don't mm-hmm. do that one. You know, mm-hmm. so it helped so me. So you see it visually. I see a little image. I get a, a wow. flash of an that's image. That's your intuition or spirit mm-hmm. guide. And that's how okay. I've asked my intuition to talk to me. Some people wow. do it for, if this was a flower or a tree or an animal, oh, what would it look like? I like that. And so so ask a question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, there you've got the key. Asking the right question to your intuition and giving it a way to answer is one of the mm. most important parts of working with our intuition. If you ask a question, if you get an answer and you don't won't know what the question is, the answer won't help you. Mm-hmm. So clarifying your question, like what is it that I need to know here? What's really on my heart? Right. And how can I let the universe speak to me? When I was living in New York, I used to wander in through the Metropolitan Museum. I would come with a question. I'd go, take me to an answer. And I would let my feet wander until I came to a piece of artwork that I could read like a tarot card for my answer. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. It worked really well. Here wow. I do it in the woods and I ask, what animal am I going to see? And it works. Before we go on, I want to take a break to talk about today's sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is full of twists and turns, highs and lows. It's important to show up for yourself through all of the struggles that life can bring. BetterHelp Online Therapy can help you navigate that journey. They will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me find calm and understanding of my fears and anxieties, so it's been really helpful. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional therapy done securely online. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log in and message your counselor anytime and schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in a waiting room like with traditional therapy. BetterHelp also makes it easy and free to change counselors if you don't like yours and you can cancel anytime if you don't like it. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is also available. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL, that's better H-E-L-P, and join over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experience professional. Special offer for the Lavender Lifestyle listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash TLL. All right, back to the podcast. Well, so is your question specific to something in your life? Like, oh, this is the question I want to answer. I'm g- Now I'm going to let my intuition guide me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Wow. And I love we- using that, the world as your mm-hmm. deck. It is. It is. It's a wonderful way. Um, Mm -hmm. And working with decks can help you develop that way of of noticing symbols and letting those symbols speak to you. Mm. You know, remember, it's a conversation. We always talk about with intuition, if if it's in your static zone, if it's that our, our intuition and our hopes and our fears often work on the same plane. And so if I'm asking about a client that I don't have a lot of stake in, I can get a pretty clear answer. But am I, if I'm asking about a child or, you know, a grandmother, I'm going to care so much that I have to be very careful how I perceive the answers because my hopes and fears will, can, will be cause static. So it's just like, right. you know, using that to calm down, calm it down and just notice what you notice. And notice the difference between what you notice and your story about it. Because it's often the story we build, which is our anxiety or our hopes talking, but our hit was correct. Mm. So it's parsing that down. But I wanted to develop, because I work with astrology so much, um, 40 some years now, that I wanted to develop, and I find that my clients don't really understand the terms. And they're used to thinking them in terms of, oh, is that good or is that bad? Not, Mm -hmm. how do I use my Pluto transit? Uh, And I want them to think about it in terms of, 
it, here's the challenge of it. Here's the gift of it. How do you want to walk mm-hmm. through with it? And right. So to help them really understand their choices. And the deck, it acts like an oracle deck. The tarot deck has a very linear process and you have fancy layouts. And what I'm finding people are using with my oracle deck is they will do a tarot deck, then they'll pull one or two cards or three cards from the oracle deck to add more information. And that that's been really rich. I'm seeing that on Instagram, really interesting examples of it. Right. I love it. But I mean, okay, mm-hmm. go ahead. <laughs> um, that when they take uh, the Oracle decks, though, are less structured the way the tarot decks are that have four suits and then uh, a higher arcana of archetypes. So and uh, there's seven, usually 76 cards in total. Most oracle decks are smaller, but in the in the 50s, but sometimes more, sometimes less. And they are a powerful set of symbols that, you know, the person who bege- or originated the deck means something to them that you can use and pull and say, what's the advice that I need at the moment? And trust that as you're shuffling it, there that sense of synchronicity, that the you and the universe will arrange to get just the information you need at the moment and, and trust when, in that process. When, so these cards each have a symbol and I know that you intended a certain meaning for the symbol, but are you saying that each person needs to use their own intuition and understand what the symbol means to them specifically? Yes. And yeah. there is a book that goes with it that will give you mm-hmm. plenty to start with. I, I think of right. the information that comes with an Oracle deck are seeds that it may, you know, how does the, what does this mean to you? Um, If the card I keep pulling for today was Ceres and Ceres, you know, is, uh, was originally the Demeter, the goddess of the grain and of harvest, the mother of Persephone. And she was who nurtured. She was also who received the dead into the underworld, but she was who grew the trop crops and brought them back to life and fed the world. And so it's about nurturing and understanding nurturance, feeling nurtured. How do you really nurture yourself? Which is a lovely part for today's. uh, I I love that. Um, For beginners who don't exactly feel connected to their intuition, what is your advice for them when getting started with Oracle decks? Uh, it's one, trust yourself a bit and play, <laughs> take a playful approach. Mm-hmm. And in that it's not deadly serious, but it's to be, to be respected, but with joy mm-hmm. and to think pretty clearly what, you know, you can ask a series of questions, but think what's first on your heart. Write it down so you can really look at the answer. It's easiest if you just really write it down and think about it. And then pull a card. You know, it could be, you know, what do I need to know today? Or it could be what's happening with this project that I'm working on? Or what do I need to know to handle that very difficult person at work? And it can give you some of the medicine to help you with the same understand the situation and make different choices around it. Mm -hmm. So the first place is just getting a clear message to pulling the card and reading on it. And then three watching during the day, how it might apply because Mm -hmm. then you begin to notice for yourself how that card resonates in your life and soul. I see. Yeah. It's a relationship that you're building with these symbols and these cards. It takes time. Mm-hmm. And when they, my, the idea with these decks, with uh, my deck, is that as you use it, all of these astrological terms become clearer to you, you mm-hmm. know, North Node or the Midheaven. And as you read them and work with them as an oracle deck, then next time you go to look at astrology or you look at your chart, you know, those, you've it become to sense. understand those three dimensionality of each of the symbols. Wow. And I feel like you have more options when you look at the chart. So I have a question. In tarot, they have like reversed versions of cards. Is that also a thing in Oracle decks, or do you just read it as it depends is? the Oracle deck? And <laughs> how I put it is uh, each as each symbol has that continuum. 
It has a challenge to it. It has a practical side and has a gift. Mm -hmm. When you pull it reversed, the challenge end is leading, Mm -hmm. but the gift is always there. If you pull it direct side up, the gift edge is leading, but the challenge is always there. I see. So it adds a subtle shift to it. It's not the opposite so Mm -hmm. much as it is, you know, you're dealing with the spectrum. You might be dealing with the difficult end of the spectrum first Mm -hmm. and the cure can be found in the positive expression. Mm -hmm. I love that there's no good and bad. It's there, there is a gift and a challenge and both are happening, but one might be stronger Mm -hmm. than the other. And often the challenges are there to grow us. You know, you Mm -hmm. look at a chart, often people find that the the best times in their life, the most successful, are right after some very tough transits. Mm -hmm. Now, did those tough transits build the muscles that they needed to make this happen? Or did they clear the karma to make this happen? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Depends on the person and on the complexity of the situation. But, you know, to to trust that those times, and, and I wouldn't say, you know, they're there because you asked for them. I don't want to do any of the, what I think of as new age fascism. You know, oh, you asked for that terrible mm-hmm. accident. But more, mm-hmm. if you had a terrible accident, how can you use it for your growth? We're not mm-hmm. saying why it happened. That's a mystery bigger than any one lifetime, I think, can tell us. But if when events happen in your life, you can use all the symbols in your chart, in your hand, in the cards to say, what can I do with this to have it? serve my purpose. Right. And that's a different take. And I understand in astrology with all there there's always a challenge we're presented with life, but what if we don't like step up to the challenge? Do you believe the challenge just keeps coming back in our lives or what happens when you fail <laughs> these challenges? Well, you know, it's interesting. And I would say that's one of the things that I see in hands where people use a lot, you know, steady amounts of drugs or alcohol Mm -hmm. is they miss the opportunities Mm -hmm. and they miss, they may not feel the worst of it, but they don't get it. You know, they don't notice the transits. They're not really working Mm -hmm. with the universe. Exactly. But when they're more awake and aware um, in some form that if you miss the challenge, it will come around. You know, we're not going to get out of this work. Some lifetime it will be through. Mm -hmm. Um, But the unique challenges of that time ask us to strengthen a muscle and that we can use those muscles later on. It asks us to expand some part of our brain or consciousness, and we can use that later on. Open our heart. Do we, when any difficult event happens, we can respond either with more compassion and understanding, which helps us manage farther on down the line, or we can get more brittle and angry and resentful and not take responsibility for our part of it. And that's going to cause a different future. That's going to mm-hmm. really, you know, bring the troubles on down the line. Mm-hmm. And and I'd say that that's been the key that I see in how people respond to transits. Are they taking responsibility, not for somebody else's actions or criticisms or trouble, but for learning what they need to learn and growing to their best of their ability? It's not something we can judge from the outside. We don't know what the other person's walking through or what they've been through, but we can make that choice for ourselves. Right. Is that what you mean when you say choice-oriented astrology? Yes. Okay. That that I'm hoping people will, to use this to help people to make the choices in their life, to see every fork in the road as Mm -hmm. a chance to choose and choose that you know, choose that which will help them be their best self, have their best life, but also just grow forward in the way that their soul came here to do rather than feel battered about by life. I, I love that perspective and I completely agree with you on that because I we talk on this podcast a lot about how you always have the choice and how you respond to what happens in life and your, the challenges are here to help you grow. <laughs> They're here to help you learn something, no matter how hard or difficult they might be. So you, you do have to take responsibility for your life. Right. And that's where the maps, the symbol systems for palmistry, astrology, um, any form of divination can give you tools along the way. It can give you a map mm-hmm. to navigate that. It can't right. walk it for you. That's always up to you. I love that. They, they, they are just the map. 
guiding us. Like, this is what to look out for. This is what you have to learn. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And this is how to get around that corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, now I want to shift to talking about your spiritual journey because you I you have so much experience and a wealth of knowledge. But one thing I want to start with is you mentioned you have a lifelong interfaith spiritual search. So what does that mean? How does how do you, you bridge spirituality with faith and all these different types of faiths out there? Uh, if you ask me what religion I am, I could answer all of the above. Mm. that I see how I see spirit talking to individual people and individual faith paths. And I trust that spirit will talk to a person the way they need to hear it. Mm. So when I'm doing spirit, spiritual counseling, I'll ask, tell me how spirit works in your life. You know, what, a, what, how are you conversing with soul? You know, they'll talk a lot. Of, I was reading a book on near-death experiences recently, and they talk about how when people start to cross over and come back, because they're the ones that tell us stories, what they see is energetically the same, whatever their path is. But who they see, is it their dog? Is it Christ? Is it a bodhisattva? You know, it depends on their tradition, their how how do their symbols work to their psyche? How has spirit been in conversation with them? And so I trust that process that all of these underneath have a consciousness that runs together. Once many years ago, I was talking about, you know, okay, I started off going to Unitarian Church, which is opens, you know, sees the beauty of all paths. I've been to, you know, I've worked as an altar person. I was always drawn to ritual, but I've done, you know, uh, reclaiming pagan work. I'm a member of the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids out of England, a Druid group. Um, I've, I'm an interfaith minister ordained. Now, the, how that came about, now we'll get, we'll get around to that. But, you know, in this search, I was talking with someone about the various different paths and the difference between polytheism and monotheism and one God and the many gods and how to work with all these different images that we have. And it was a foggy day in the winter and there was snow on the bottom and there was fog in the air and it was a full moon, which acted like a scrying globe. It just, the full moon was coming through the fog. It was very diffuse. And I had this powerful image of the one. And then from that, you know, the, the God and goddess, and from that, all the millions of deities and images and bodhisattvas and spirits that we could work with, and that I could follow any one of those paths back to the one. Mm-hmm. They all came back to the one. They were all valid. They all spoke to different people. And so that was the image that I hold deep in my heart underneath all the other work that I do. So I I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico um, in the early 2000s. Uh, Well, it was about, it was early to the end of 2000, beginning of 2001. And I kept having a dream where it was various different dreams, but the phone would ring and I would answer the phone in the dream. And I heard a deep woman's voice saying, I'm sending you back to the front lines. I go, what the heck does that mean? It happened four or five times. Wow. Um, In the spring, I married my mate uh, who now teaches here at the tribal college. That's what we're doing in Montana. And uh, but three days after the wedding, Ren was offered a job in New York City. So we moved to New York three weeks before 9 wow. 11. And we were there, and I was sent back to the front lines. And I was wow. there. I, just I had chills. just gone out of town, and I came right back in. I could, you know, I was there when it happened mm-hmm. around this smelling, you know, the. 
you smell corpses burning for months mm-hmm. after. It was oh so powerful. But I also saw how spirit worked in New York, really taking care of one another. And I saw amazing heroism and the need for spirit and the, the, all the people that were dealing with how many souls had left so quickly. Um, and in that process, so I, I, you know, I decided, I saw, I met somebody who was working at the interfaith seminary, the new seminary for interfaith studies there. And they had worked as a chaplain down in the pit at doing the reclamation from 9-11. And I was also, one of my clients was a paramedic working down in the pit and was taking care of the people that were doing the digging. And so every day she came in with a different story. And the only way I could help anybody down there, I helped her so she could help them. So every night Mm -hmm. she came and told me her story. So I got some firsthand information and and I could support her to do that work. But he told a wonderful story. Uh, My, uh, the the head of the the rabbi that was head of this school, rabbi and reverend uh, interfaith minister, And he said he was down there one day and there was a guy in a crane working in the pit. And he wasn't used to, you know, the the first responders were used to dealing with difficult situations and bodies. And but the construction workers who were doing the digging were not. And so he, you know, the with the noon whistle rang and the guys came out of his crane that was digging in the ground. And he just started sobbing and the you know rabbi roger walked over and handed him a handkerchief and just did just sat there and he looked up saw the chaplain helmet and then told him all the things that he'd seen and what he was worried about and what was going on and on and shared and you know rabbi would listen to the image of the the sufi heart the heart with wings just holding him and listening. And the man told his old story. And then the the finally the, the horn rang again. And he said, oh, I, I got to go back to work. Thank you so much. And then he went back to work. Rabbi hadn't said a word. Uh, next week, the man saw him in the in the main lunchroom and said, thank you. What you said last week helped me so much. Wow. And he hadn't said a word, but he listened with that, with heart, with for for spirit. Mm -hmm. And that taught me so much about the process of how do we really listen? How do we make our meditation a way of listening to spirit? How do we Mm -hmm. offer that to one another? How do we share that in our counseling work? Right. So a lot of the times it's it's not about the words. It's about the energy holding space and just, wow. I, I thank you for sharing that story. That's I there's so many thoughts and emotions just hearing you talk about that era. And I, I can't believe that you experienced that firsthand as well. <sighs> okay. That was pretty so, powerful. <laughs> it definitely was. Mm-hmm. For what tips would you give to people who want to enhance this connection with spirit? enhance their, you know, because I think a lot of people are so busy with their everyday lives. Not everybody lives in nature in Montana. So what are the ways that you Mm -hmm. would advise? Again, how do you bring yourself to be present to spirit? How do you listen? Mm -hmm. And if you, if it's a matter of saying, spending a minute kind of calling in a sacred space for you, it could be five minutes in the morning where you just kind of surround yourself in light, you know, you, whatever your spiritual path is as a way of creating sacred space of feeling safe for a minute with spirit. And then, you know, you can say, I need help with this or help me understand this. Put out a question or a, or a thing. You could pull a, a, a card from an Oracle deck and just say, help me understand what this means and listen to it like you would to an old friend who is telling you their mm-hmm. love story. Mm. Or you can ask for that as you're going to sleep at night. Please, in my dreams, help me understand something. Mm. 
Now, you may not remember your dream, but in the morning, you may know something that you didn't know the night before. You may have a sense of, yeah, I really should take that job. Or, yeah, no, I really shouldn't. Even looks like a good job. You know, you have a new sense of yourself, of understanding. So I'd say the main is how do you bring yourself present to spirit, to listen. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, in uh, the Islamic tradition, You do that five times a day. You say your prayers five times a day. And for Western world finds that a little much, but the idea is do you, how do do you show up for it? How do you find a way, whether it's your morning meditation, five minute prayer. I have one friend who prays in the hot tub every morning and (laughs) it works. You know, it's like, how do you find a way in your life to bring yourself to spirit? The traditions that we use, like lighting the incense or calling in the four directions or asking the archangels to be at our corners, those are way of, like, rituals that open that, that doorway for us that help us feel safer. So we're not just mm-hmm. opening, you know, um, just because it's non-corporeal doesn't mean it's wise. You know, like we're open, choosing what we're tuning into when we open ourselves up on the spiritual side and just feeling that connection with all just for a minute. Just uh, may I open to my connection? There's another pe- another um, example that I have that helps me. Um, my mate is a cell biologist, uh, native uh, of native descent, teaching here on the reservation, teaching training science teachers. But as a cell biologist, Ren would talk about how each cell in our body has these two roles. It has to know it's healthy as a cell. It has to take care of itself as a cell. And just, you know, to to work well. And it has to be aware that it is a member of a body. That it's, you know, my skin cell is a skin cell. It can't pretend it's a liver cell or my skin is in trouble. You know, and it has to be aware that, you know, if a cell just makes more and more of itself, it becomes cancer. It has to be aware of its role in the whole. Mm -hmm. And I think of that, that we are... Mm -hmm cells in the body of the one yes and that we have to both take care of ourselves and do our work who we are in in our life and know that we could be everything and anything and to remember that we're part of the whole how Mm. can we contribute to the health of the whole be responsible Mm. for the whole and feel that that bigger connection and that that is an amazing metaphor that makes so much more, it's clear now. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. because I, I think a lot of people are miss. I mean, there are people missing both of those, <laughs> not <laughs> taking care of themselves and forgetting that they are part of something exactly. bigger, the whole. Exactly. Wow. And that you okay. can lean into that, you know, remembering that the whole, that spirit, which I think of as all the consciousness in the universe put together, working together. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't, not something outside of us. We are a cell yes. in that. And yes. if we are a cell in that, uh, you know, we, I know that my body, my whole self knows more than a cell on my skin mm-hmm. and, but my cell on my skin needs, can work with me on this. We can work together mm-hmm. to make, to make a help, a healthy whole. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, something else I want to ask you, I feel like you would have something nice to say about this is I I do feel like the world is going through a lot of changes. A lot of people are going through difficult times ever since the pandemic, maybe even before that. And it doesn't feel like it's, it's, we're not through it. And I'm sure in astrology, you know, the transits we're going through. I've talked about the Pluto return of the U S on this podcast and the Pluto is going into Aquarius soon. So, so what are your thoughts? How, how can we deal with the difficult times? Well, I have great hope um, and for all of that. And when, you know, one of the pieces that was helpful for me, because I write a weekly column called Star Codes, which you can find online, medium.com and a few other places that talks about the astrology of the week. And I've been doing that for 30 years. And I write a, a yearly overview for We Moon Calendar. It kind of predicts, you should see what I said around 2020. But Um, And I write it the year before. So I get a chance to kind of predict what's going to be and then see what happens. But to do that work, I had looked back 5,000 years and looked at the course of history and how things unfolded in relationship to uh, the transits. And so 
you know, it, it's not so spectacular. Last time Pluto was leaving Capricorn and going into Aquarius, we had the American Revolution and we invented democracy. That's mm-hmm. a good thing. Yeah. Now, it always gets worse before it gets better. Right at the end mm-hmm. of a planet, when Pluto is leaving a sign, it often kind of gives us the most intense version. It's like the chapter review of everything we've learned. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the review of difficult systems um, of, uh, you know, the, the use and abuse of power, electrical power, personal power, political power is, I think, one of the dynamics that we're experiencing now. Now, when we looked at the, you know, you've, if you've had astrologers on, you, you know, you've talked about the Pluto-Jupiter-Saturn conjunction at the beginning mm-hmm. of 2020 yes. that we looked at, we go, like, is there going to be an invasion? Well, we, it was, it was microbial. That's what I, it, it, we can't always see how it's going to unfold. We also saw all the difficult dynamics around that. We saw the restrictions that were involved and yet we moved through it quite quickly compared to other pandemics, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, my Most of my mother's family died in the spring of 1920 after the wow. 1918 flu epidemic because it took two years to work through. Wow. And it even after that it was. So it's it's a process mm-hmm. that we that we work through on these we, we see that in breath and the out breath of the challenge, how we learn it, what we're working through, and where we take it from here. Wow. If we think of ourselves as evolving always, and, and I think of past lives and rebirth, there's always a new, there's always a, 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 a new influx of newly evolving beings coming in. So it may not look like we're getting anywhere, but I do think we are, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and the transits right now are tricky. They're tough. They were particularly tough this winter because Venus and Mercury went back and forth over Pluto three times because they retrograde Mm -hmm. back and forth and, you know, brought our heart ourselves to the heart of life, death, the meaning, existence. And am I alone in all of this? And, you know, what's, what, what do I do? Um, It, you know, seems to have brought the crisis in Ukraine and Russia to a uh, you know, a high point, you know, the, mm-hmm. the fear of being powerless, I think, is what set this whole power dynamic off. And because I think we are changing and we are switching and the population of America is changing into a more diverse um, ecosystem as people, you know, the, that the human diversity is uh, shifting and the, you know, the white people that have been in control for so long are just becoming more and more of a minority. And as that shifts, the power dynamics in America are going to become more Aquarian. They're going to become more, how do we work together? I see. As I think. And in that was also, how do we still hear ourselves even when the group is doing something? That's the danger mm-hmm. side of Aquarius that we'll work through. I see. And that that's going to be a whole, that, how long is that era? Long time, right? Well, yeah, Pluto is now outside the orbit of Neptune. It's heading far away from the sun, from the mm-hmm. Earth. And so as it heads farther away, the transits slow down. So this is going to be about 20 years in Aquarius. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, but it's less intense the farther out it gets. I see. Pluto transits between uh, 20, uh, nine, sorry, 1980 and 1999 Pluto was inside the orbit of Neptune, really buzzed very close to the Earth. And a Pluto transit then was a Pluto transit. It really was a confrontation with life and death. As soon as it crossed over, when it crossed over and started being farther out than Neptune again, um, that was the week that they downgraded it from a planet to uh, an asteroid, funnily enough. But now it's having its its more existential angst than terrible Mm -hmm. event. So I I am seeing a shift with it. I see. Awesome. Do you have any last messages to our audience? Just considering that our audience are are mostly young females Mm -hmm. and yeah, I I guess, yeah, general thoughts, spirituality. I say listening to their own voice. One of the pieces that I find so helpful for our development of intuition is starting to keep your own journal on when you get a hit, 
Like, mm-hmm. I don't trust that person, or I'm really curious about this, or I do think mm-hmm. he likes me, is to write it down and notice where in your body you feel it. Do you feel it in your gut? Do you feel it in your heart? Do your shoulders go up, go down? Just notice that. And then notice what happens. Write down later, I thought he liked me. That was just wishful thinking, you know? So I'll now mm-hmm. know that when my shoulders go up, it probably isn't what happened. So <laughs> begin to trust your own signals. And to, to, to notice, I have a story. My story is this person's not talking to me. I have a hit. The person is distracted. I can't reach them. I, can't, I don't know why. I, my story is they heard what I said about them yesterday and they're mad. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then notice the hit and notice the story. And then ask, find out. Oh, they just have a stomach ache. And notice that your story was wrong. Because that was your feelings. It's about you. But your hit was right. They weren't available to you that day. And begin to listen to trust. As you quiet that down, you begin to hear yourself closer and closer. And use uh, and begin to trust your own intuition, which is really Mm -hmm. a helpful tool as we make it through life. Yeah, I think that's so powerful if you're able to strengthen your connection with your intuition, which I, I, I'm i inspired to do more of that. I used to journal a lot. I stopped because I got very busy, but this is reminding me that I need to make that space and that time to connect with my intuition. Wonderful. Awesome. So lastly, where can we find you online, Heather? Uh, you could starcodes.us or Rowan Robbins, R O A N R O B B I N S dot com. And Beautiful. you can find my uh, the Star Codes Oracle deck anywhere. Um, you can find them online. The artist involved is a wonderful tattoo artist from Brazil living in Australia who did the artwork for him. So it's really juicy and <laughs> interesting. Artwork. I I'm love really it. With the artist. Awesome. So, Everybody, I will link um, all of her products and books in the show notes down below. Definitely check out Heather Rowan Robbins. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really enjoy this conversation and your energy is just great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Anytime.